CityCast from Explicity. Long ago, there were no people here. There was only water everywhere. In the womb of this bottomless mass of water that extended to the very horizon, Mata Basumati, Mother Earth, slumbered. Who knew how long she lay there? One day, she suddenly woke up. Mother Earth raised her head slowly and gazed at the sky, the sun, and the moon and the stars. Sunlight fell on her body. Unknown to anyone, the land gradually turned dry. The marshland became suitable for human habitation. At that time, after wandering through many roads and many lands and suffering many hardships, a band of nomadic people who had been compelled by the stipulation of the Shastras to adopt nomadic lives, finally reached this inaccessible region that people were unaware of. They were entranced by the beauty and majesty of Mother Earth. There were plenty of land suitable for cultivation and plenty of sweet grass for cattle fodder. When they scattered a handful of seeds on the land, it returned a thousandfold harvest. There was a limitless store of water all around, and if one merely stretched out one's hand, there was a surfeit of fish to be had. Seeing all this, the people gave up their nomadic existence and settled down in this uninhabited region that was inaccessible to the upholders of religious law. They hoped to live there permanently. Those were days of great joy and contentment. If one went down to the water with nets, there was plenty of fish. On the land, there was enough fruits within hand's reach. And if one labored on the land, unending supplies of paddy, sesame, jute, and mustard were reaped. Nature had granted a hundred kinds of food to sustain life. In that era, people's lives were very peaceful and free of anxiety. Everything was simple and straightforward. After a whole day's toil, people returned home in the evening and got together for story, song, laughter, and joy. And then they sank into a deep, happy slumber at night. Weren't there any troubles there? Of course there were. The disease, grief, nature's fury, all the troubling things that are there today were also to be found then. But the dastardly skill of appropriating the fruit of another man's labor was not there. There wasn't the cunning endeavor of man's subjugation by man. The place was free of all these ills of the outside world. The reason I use the word fortuitous in the title of this episode of The Literary City is because Sanjoy K. Roy, one of the founders of the Jaipur Literature Festival, let's call it JLF like everyone else, told me that its success was accidental. Some say there are no accidents. You know you dinged your dad's car because you were careless and not because the fates conspired to override your otherwise cautious and attentive demeanor. Typically, people become successful because of their efforts, not despite them. Usually, you will find that what we ascribe to luck included a great deal of knowledge, foresight, and a gust of planning. As a wise man once ought to have said, the harder you work, the luckier you get, yada yada. Now, JLF has editions all over the world, and as a footnote to the flagship, its parent company, Teamwork Arts, handles several more events every year. But Sanjoy Roy is my guest on the Literary City today because I want to establish that someone who turned what he calls an accident into the biggest festival of literature in the world is himself literary. And there's only one way to find out, and that is to ask him. So, to that end, it is my privilege to present the man that speaks for literature. Sanjoy, welcome to the Literary City. Many thanks, Ramji. Pleasure to be here. To begin with, what was that wonderfully crafted passage you read? Uh, the excerpt that I'm reading is from The Runaway Boy uh, by Manoranjan Vyapari. Manoranjan Vyapari came as a uh, uh, immigrant, as a refugee from Bangladesh into India, stayed in refugee camps, um, had was assaulted at some point of time, and then he ran away to join the Naxal movement. And in the Naxal movement, he was 
you know, he was very successful as a, as a Naxal. He was then uh, captured, sent to prison, which is where he actually learned to read and write, which was amazing. So he used to see these notices on the prison wall and then use a stick to write the letters in the dust in the prison courtyard. That's amazing. And how did he get discovered? When he gets released from the prison, he's given a rickshaw uh, to, to, to ride as part of his rehabilitation program uh, by the superintendent. And riding the rickshaw, driving the rickshaw one day, or rather pulling the rickshaw one day in Calcutta, uh, he gives the person a lift and he asks her uh, the meaning of a very complicated uh, Bengali word. And the lady says to him, this is the meaning, but where did you find the word? And he said, well, you know, I'm reading a book. So she said, what book? And he said, I'm reading Mahashweta Devi's book. So she said, ah, okay. They reach the destination. She gets off and she says, why don't you show me the book? So he pulls it out from under the seat of the rickshaw and gives it to, to the lady. And she says, well, I am Mahashweta Devi. I'm fascinated by your story. I'm happy to help you publish your new uh, book. Uh, Manuranjan goes on, he, he doesn't publish that article. He goes on to write this wonderful book, uh, which is now translated into English called The Runaway Boy. He was then uh, the head cook, uh, the Dalit head cook of a school. Uh, the book gets published. He comes to the Jaipur Richa Festival, releases it um, in Bengali, uh, comes back a couple of years later, releases it in English. And as it happens, the New York Times and the Washington Post um, uh, journalists are there, hear his story because we're traveling together, write it up, and then it goes on into many translations. In the last West Bengal elections, uh, Mamata Banerjee offers him a seat from Howrah, uh, where he wins as a, a legislator and now is a, is a member of the Legislators wow. Assembly. So a brilliant story. And this particular version is a wonderful translation uh, by R uh, V. Ramaswamy. Stuff that only dreams are made of. All right, let's say that we're in the middle of the JLF. Things are hopping. Everyone's doing their thing. Is that when you take a coffee break? You know, the festival itself means, Ramji, it's like the great big Indian wedding where I'm the father of the bride. So there's no coffee break per se. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm out there to receive people. I'm out there to make sure that, you know, all our guests, and that's my only role. The festival runs pretty much seamlessly because my colleagues, uh, you know, take most of the uh, brunt of that. But it's really just that father of the bride thing. Great Indian weddings attract a great many Indian people, sometimes uninvited people, just members of the public. Now, you had an interesting story about that. Um, it was the first time we had put into place security because the weekends had got really busy. And I was there as I am in the morning of, uh, you know, each day to receive people. You know, we opened the gates at 7.30. And this was at Diggy Palace, which was our, our previous uh, venue. And I was standing there and a man and a boy walked through the Haveli gates of, of Diggy. And they were stopped because they looked like they didn't belong. And because I was there, I went up and I said, you know, Bhaiya, kya, kya baat hai? You know, can I help you? And he said, you know, I sleep on the pavement down the road uh, opposite the SMS hospital. And I know that um, I'll never be able to afford to send my son to school, nor be able to buy a book for him. But I thought if he heard, heard a story, it would change his life forever. And I hear you tell stories here. And I'm so sorry. And he turned to move. And I said, no, this is for you. And for us, in many ways, that really was when we realized that this festival was successful because everybody thought it was their own and they could access it. And for somebody like that to walk through the Haveli gates is you know, quite remarkable. And that really is, uh, is what we've always aspired to, the free flow of knowledge and information, uh, knowing that with considered knowledge, you can bring about significant social change. Uh, going forward. Is this why festivals of literature exist? Interesting question. Uh, you know, literature at the end of the day is what allows you to make sense of, of the past. Mm -hmm. It gets you to understand the present, but it also allows you to envision the future. So, for example, uh, 
the great books, George Orwell's 1984, or uh, the books on, which so inspired people to look beyond. Uh, it's a celebration of the word. And if you look at sound and word as, you know, as, as, as coming together as one, the primordial sound as we know, we, in Hinduism, you look at it as om, or you look at it as, a, as the sound of a conch. Uh, and in different religions or in different uh, traditions, you look at it differently. But it's really that, it's the very essence of creation, the essence of imagination. And when you come together with imagination, creation, innovation, what better way to celebrate this than a festival of literature, which in many ways is a festival of ideas, is a festival of people, of human beings being able to empathize. So was this sense of shared history and heritage a part of your plan when you first thought of the festival? Ramji, you know, the starting of this festival is purely accidental. So while Harvard Business School case study sort of has us having a five-year and a 10-year and a 15-year plan to take over the world, none of that is true. And What was it like the day the JLF opened? January, uh, you know, the festival opened, seven o'clock in the morning, cold winter, April morning. And I looked into the Darbar Hall, which was our Garb Griha, or the inception where we started. And with my colleague, with 230 chairs or 270 chairs, whatever. And I said, who is going to come? Uh, you know, remove 100 chairs and, and stuff like that. And so we had no idea uh, that this would really come to pass. But people did come. In that first year, 7,000 people came through the gates of Diggy. Uh, the footfall was that. And the next year, everybody went away and brought another friend. And it grew to 14,000 in the third year, 30, and the fourth year, 60, and so on and so forth. And it was really this, Ramji, it was that sense of being, of course, Jaipur itself was Jaipur. So people knew. Uh, you know, about its forts and its palaces. And and every stone in Digi had a story to tell, right? Great romance and the great battles and the great rivalries that you look at when you look at places like Rajasthan. The stones aching to release these stories and perhaps subsume themselves with more stories waiting to be told. You go away enriched, you know, because you stumbled upon a new idea, a new thought, that really sums it up in terms of what the festival means. Maybe when you first started, you didn't have a B-school type business plan, but do you now? Um, yes, we, we, we're very organized. I mean, you know, you cannot launch something this size without every detail having been thought through. These don't happen by accident. Right. So now do you have a 10-year vision plan or something like that? Uh, I don't think we have a 10-year vision plan, Ramji. So, you know, what we do have is a strategy rather than a plan. And initially, when we went from, when we expanded into a JLF London, right. it was part of our strategy. Are these editions that you have in different countries, are they generic to the host city or are they JLF outreach programs? Uh, so it's JLF London, JLF Houston, JLF New York, JLF Belfast, JLF Adelaide, JLF Doha. It's JLF uh, in that particular city. So it's JLF branded with the city. Uh, and then the venue, so it's JLF uh, London at the British Library. None of these are things because, you know, location, location, location. Uh, it, it, it means everything. Speaking of locations, you have something coming up in the Maldives exotic location for a festival of literature, isn't it? Totally, Ramji. It certainly wasn't part of our strategy. Specifically? Jaipur Literature Festival is about the free flow of knowledge and information. We have stayed away from doing bespoke uh, uh, editions. A bespoke JLF is not such a bad idea in the Maldives. Had you been to the Maldives before? I'd never been to the Maldives. So I did eke out two days in 2020. One went out there and, oh my God, it's just incredible, Ramji. It's not incredible, it's just beautiful. It's True, the Maldives are magic. What specifically about this venue, Soneva Fushi, what about it moved your needle? 
It's an eco resort where everything from recycling their glass to growing their own vegetables to being able to manage their own waste to the the beauty with which their design process has been put into place apart from the design itself is stunning just for some reason it felt yes it's time we do did this you know because everything seemed right the food was glorious the weather was wonderful the atmosphere was right and it just seemed to be a place yes it'll be a different kind of festival much smaller it'll be you know smallest that we've ever done um but i do believe that there's a place for it now uh, and hopefully it will bring together um, intelligentsia it'll bring together influencers uh, writers thinkers ideators all the people who we need to buy in uh, to be able to in many ways also push back against the narrative of hatred that we are seeing i mean that's not a place that you can land and hit anything or anybody so now from the exclusive back to the inclusive and back to jaipur in india there's always a somewhat parochial push for inclusion i imagine that you are no exemption from these sorts of demands so how do you cope with it and stay true to the spirit of the jlf let me answer that somewhat differently um you know writers write not necessarily because they want to entertain they write because they have a coalition to write and in writing they put out their their inner being and not everybody obviously needs to agree what we try and do is we try and create the opportunity of providing an inclusive viewpoint from different perspectives so we are not didactic what we try and do is that can we find considered dialogue as you said ram there's a lot of pressure uh, on us because you know uh, uh different kinds of viewpoints want to be represented at, on our platforms i can imagine so we we, we always walk that very tight rope and so both sides love to hate us everybody loves to hate us in that larger political spectrum mm. but that's the nature of the beast right and sure we don't always get it right we are a platform for all points of view so you're saying that you've been able to steer the course i don't know whether we've been able to steer the course i mean we've been able to m- maneuver along the hurdles and you know there are a number of things that we uh, face people file cases uh, uh you know the pressures that come with something like this but it's yeah it's part of it's part of the space that we're all negotiating i wish it was different i wish uh, i wish the arts and you know this is part of the arts while it's reflective of politics is not necessarily political uh, unfortunately in india this is seen to be uh, you know very much part of the political always communication always. or dialogue you were quoted in an interview as saying the arts act as a pressure valve they give you the platform to release your angst it seems to me that when writers get together say at a festival of literature they're always releasing their angst uh, totally because you know writers as i said you know they don't necessarily write to entertain they write because they have a passion they have a volition and everybody comes from a different perspective our stories are different i mean we may be on this on one conversation but your take away of what i may have said would could be different from the next person or the next person listening to listening in to this podcast Uh, so writers come from that and you know at the end of the day ideas are contentious and it, they need to be. you need to be able to argue and debate and discussion and without that societies won't evolve for anything to evolve any thought to evolve any science to be created any any expedition to be undertaken uh, any research to be done it has to start with that fundamental question of what if we all thought alike uh, as hitler wanted in nazi germany uh, and 
others Franco did in Spain and Mussolini in Italy. And then, yeah, we'd be a very boring society right now. Of course, there must be debate. Of course, there must be discussion. And dissent is very much part of the idea of, or the fundamental idea of coexistence and democracy. Now, over the years at the JLF, you've met so many interesting authors, authors of note from all over the world. Which ones do you fanboy? You know, I fanboy every writer who comes to the festival. Marcus de Satoy, for example, uh, or uh, or Simon uh, Back Montefiore. I never read his book, Jerusalem, when I heard his session. I was just so hooked, went out, bought the book, read, read it, and I was like, every president or anybody who wants to interfere in the politics of Jerusalem needs to first read this, get a sense of history over 3,000 years, and then step back and say, can I seriously try and sort this out? Impossible. So, you know, I just love the knowledge that comes with this. It's such a fascinating word, uh, Ramji. Now, much has been said about your company, uh, what's it called now? Teamwork, Teamwork Arts. Teamwork Arts. Teamwork Arts. And all the wonderful work that you do at the JLF and otherwise. But I did not find too much information about you. So I'd like to talk about your literary side. Let's start with theater. Now, you are something of a drama buff. Yeah, my, 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 training, my training pretty much was in theater. All the way from school into university. Uh, you know, I was always part of theater in, in university. Uh, I joined Theatre Action Group, which was uh, its artistic director was Barry John. And where was this? This was in Delhi. And did you like acting? Oh, yeah. But as we started sort of exploring the whole uh, space, uh, you know, one did so much. But then I realized that the only way to keep this, this passion of theatre alive uh, was if I had to make it a business for everybody, right? Because it kept falling apart around its ears because there was nobody to manage it. So more and more my responsibility, uh, rather than my love for acting, uh, then moved to this need to be able to keep it together. I still try and sneak some time off and on every few years to direct a new production and nobody will cast me anymore. They all think I'm really difficult and cranky, which I'm not. Acting and you've actually written a play. Neil Gams from Landgraf, which is Germany's big theater touring, uh, well, a touring company that tour dance and theater music. Neil one day came, came to me and said, you know, I really need you to do a new play. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll do it in 2025 or whatever. And he was like, no, you have to give me a commitment. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, in, the, in a moment of weakness, I sort of gave him a date three or four years down the line saying, that, yeah, I'll do a new play by then. You know, because he was keen that I wrote it and directed this new production. But then life carries on, right? You're so busy. And then one day he arrived. I was in London and he arrived at the RSA and uh, he said, Sanjay, I brought the contract. And I'm going, what contract? And he said, no, you committed that on this in this month, this year, you will sign the contract for us to do this new play. And I'm groaning and moaning. Anyway, I signed the contract. And then I was like, so they'd committed about a million euro to this new touring production. Wow. And I was so guilty, Ramji, because I was like, who puts this kind of money in? I was telling my colleagues, I said, let's give it back. I mean, you know, and of course, I hadn't got down to writing the new play, supposedly. And my colleagues were being hysterical because we had a delivery date now. It was all committed. The tour was booked. And I remember I was in Heathrow Airport and Sharupa, my producer colleague, called me and said, I don't care. I am not speaking to this person again. By the time you land in, in Delhi or wherever you're landing, you need to send me uh, you know, the first draft of this new production. And so I wrote what came out to be Bollywood Love Story. And it was amazing because there it's touring across the world, you know, Russia and Germany and China and across, across Spain and Italy. And I remember this hysterical moment. We were in the south of Italy. I think we were in Catanzaro. And here we were in Catanzaro. And it was the inauguration of the new opera funded by the dawn of the area. And in the script, there's this thing about uh, in the second half, it opens with 
the, and the father of this girl is the Don, the bad guy, you know, and blah, 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 this great music. And the manager comes running out and he says, sir, sir, in, impossible, impossible. You know, you have to stop this. You can't say Don is the... I said, why? He said, no, this is the, the-, the theater is that for a dog. <laughs> and, you know, he shoot us and blah, blah, blah. And I remember at the end when I went up to see him, I said, I, I hope you enjoy. He, of course, we couldn't understand each other's languages, but he was having a, a, a an uproarious time. And the funny thing is I was standing at the back of the hall. So when he laughed, then everybody laughed. <laughs> and there were more gunmen in that hall than I'd ever seen before. That sounds like a scene from a mob satire film. Totally. I mean, you know, when you're on tour, uh, as you know, Ramji, especially with theatre, mm-hmm. there's a story a minute, <laughs> you know, who's run away with whom, who's disappeared. All the time. You know, all of that, and you're negotiating through this, who's left their passport behind it, whichever city, and uh, you know, great fun. You're a good raconteur which means you're a writer. Is there a secret stash of Sanjoy Roy writing that is waiting to burst out? You know, a funny thing that you asked me this question this day before yesterday, I was at a lunch with a publishing house who did this pitch for me to write, Okay. you know, a a particular book. I'm sure the time will be right when I'll do that. Um, uh, Actually, to be honest, I have sat down to write, so... I've got a couple of chapters of a book that I'm working on around hosts and a book on food because I'm a great foodie. What was that uh, first one again? On ghosts and ghosts and spirits. You know, I've always been very attracted oh, wow. to things that go, uh, that go. Things that go bump at night. Yeah, it's not, it's not really there yet. And I haven't had the discipline to be able to set that time aside yet to be able to do that. But it will come. I mean, the stories are in my head. That was unusual and unexpected, but I shouldn't be surprised, I guess. Well then, with everything that you're doing, break a leg. Sanjoy Roy, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being my guest on The Literary City. Thank you so much, Ramji, and I do hope uh, this uh, podcast travels all over. And more strength to you, and thank you for holding up... uh, the arts and literature and getting the considered word out, totally important, more so in today's time. Thank you. And that was Sanjoy Roy of the Jaipur Literature Festival. And I will be right back with that fun segment, What's That Word? And I'm back with What's That Word? where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And to help me with it is my co-host. She's demoness of the dictionary, but I will let her introduce herself as always. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. How's things today? Hey, hey, that was a great interview. Hey, yeah, thanks. Sanjay Roy. Yeah, what an interesting dude. I mean, I've really always wanted to visit the Jaipur Literature Festival one day. Never got around to it. You know, there's a sure shot method to achieve that. Yeah? What? Tell me. Write a book and get on the speaker's roster. (laughs) Gee, thanks. Okay, second, let me put that in my task list. (laughs) Task list. (laughs) Oh, how efficient of you. (laughs) All right, P with an A, what's the word? Yeah, so in your interview with Sanjoy Roy, I heard him say didactic. Yes, you would have. Okay, didactic. What do you know of the meaning? Yeah, okay. So didactic uh, is something that's designed to teach. So I'm guessing there's an interesting etymology to this. You know what? There's really not much to this word. It's what you said pretty much summed up the meaning, the etymology, and the kitchen sink. Oh. And I'm not about to jump into the whole proto-Indo-European root of the whole thing because that would be too didactic. (laughs) The Greek word didaktikos simply translates to apt to teach or designed to teach. That's the root. Uh So a lecture or anything else, any other material that might impart teaching would be didactic. 
So in Sanjoy's specific case, he meant that in the curation of the Jaipur Literature Festival, they would bring together authors and writers and thinkers yeah. and have the free flow of thoughts and ideas. And that would form the basis of curation, not a desire to teach or harangue people. Right. You see? Yeah. Now there's a branch of this in, in whatever it is that they have branches other than trees. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, didacticism. Right. It's a branch of philosophy, actually, didacticism. Okay. And it has to do with instructional and informative qualities of literature, art, and design. Okay. Architects think they're designers, walk around saying didacticism to each other. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know your dad's an architect. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Just pulling his leg on your behalf. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe then autodidactic means teaching oneself, correct? Right. When you instruct yourself, you are engaging in autodidacticism. Yeah. So that means in Manoranjan Vyapari's book, The Runaway Boy. The one that Sanjoy read from. Sanjoy read from. Yeah, that's the one. So the protagonist, uh, who is a rickshaw puller, was autodidactic. Well, had he driven an auto rickshaw, yeah. <laughs> well, there goes your one allowed dad joke. Oh, damn. Wasted it. <laughs> you know, over the years, this business of didactic has also been used to no good in, in a sly manner, like religion, for example. You know, they develop these little chants and ditties and parables, and they hide them in folk stories, mm -hmm. and they slip them in when you're not looking. You know, they use it as a way to slide into your DMs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that um, it's sort of the same for children's education. Right. They put uh, messages into the simplest things. They do. And again, not all of it good. Like how? You know that kindergarten rhyme, Ring of Roses? Yeah, that, that one about the plague. Yeah, the plague, right. You know, pocket full of posies totally rhymes with roses. <laughs> and they put those posy flowers in their pockets because didactically, someone said they'd ward off the pandemic. Right. Well, it's not very different from the present day, is it? When we bang on pots and pans, <laughs> you know... To ward off the uh, coronavirus, yeah. you know, everyone believed it. They bought the didactic. We all had a pocket full of yeah. posies. <laughs> yeah. Or take that other little rhyme, Rockabye Baby. It totally instructed infants not to haul their cradles to the tops of trees. <laughs> yeah. How dastardly didactic that is. Dastardly didactic. Anyway... I hate this preachy teachy stuff, don't you? Are we getting personal? Should I go? <laughs> Not yet. You may stay and drop some more knowledge in here now. Well, you know, teachy preachy is not far from the sentiment because of late, the word didactic <laughs> has taken on a kind of uh, negative connotation. It stands for things that are dull, you know, pompous, overly instructive. Mm. And worse, moralistic. Exactly. So see what I mean by teachy preachy stuff? Well, as the French say, touchy. <laughs> but there's also an interesting twist over here. To discuss the etymology of uh -huh. didactic is to loop back into itself, you know, like a snake eating its tail. How? Well, the etymology of didactic is the didactic of didactic. <laughs> yeah, it's like asking someone the spelling of spelling. Oh, that's very good. The spelling of spelling. <laughs> All right, I'm now going to chant the goodbye yeah. in goodbyes. <laughs> okay, P with an A, that's usual. That was a great deal of fun. Let's do it again next week. That's our show. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for the fan mail. The fan messages really keeps us warm. All right. See you again next Wednesday. 